for all you writers out there that are struggling, trying to get into the industry, you should talk to Chaz Palminteri. He was one of them at one time. I uh, stuck to his guns and got the Bronx Tale made. Amazing story behind that. But uh, don't give up. You know, you got to start somewhere. If you have that genius inside you and you have the, uh, you know, the determination to make it work, you'll get there. Hope everybody is doing well. All is very good. Very blessed on this end. As always, my friends, I give all praise, honor, and glory and thanksgiving to God. And speaking of thanksgiving, hope everybody had a great one. Mine was terrific. Ate a lot. The family, the whole bit. It's always the greatest holiday. No presents, no shopping, just food. Great. But you know what? I got to mention this. Come to food shopping. I spent 150 bucks more this year than I did last year. And last year, I remember we spent a few bucks more. It's crazy. We bought the smallest turkey we ever had I think 15 pounds because we had less people coming over less people coming over on $150 more than I ever spent before but Bidenomics is really working I'm not getting into politics but man you could feel it when you go shopping people I can tell you that much but anyway we had a great uh, Thanksgiving hope all of you did also hope you got a chance to relax quick announcement on December 30th in one socket just outside of Providence Rhode Island I'm appearing that night. Tickets are on sale. We're going to say goodbye to 223 and say hello to 224. We'll have a glass of champagne together. It'll be great. And I have a special surprise for all of you that attend a first time deal. Nobody has seen this before. I'm going to reveal it that night. It's going to be cool. And it's going to be very relevant to that area in Providence. Some of you may get a little uh, hint of what I'm talking about, but Providence was a stronghold at one time. We all know that, you know, it was a, uh, uh, there was a real presence of the mob in that town. So I got a little sneak preview of a couple of things then, but that's uh, December 30th in one socket, just outside of Providence. Today, what am I going to do? So many people come to me all the time. Michael, I got a script. I got the best story. This should be a television series. I'm going to make a movie. Everybody thinks that they have the best story. And you know what? Maybe they do. Who knows? But you don't realize how difficult it is, number one, to get a good movie made. Number two, to get a television series. The process is grueling. Very, very difficult. Yes, I'm still working on mine. The strike is over. I'm not going to update you yet. I'll update you when I really have something to update you about. But yes, we're working on it. But it's very, very difficult, people. It's not easy. And The Sopranos went through the same thing. I'll never forget, it's 1995, I'm out of prison, I'm on the Universal Studios lot. A friend of mine by the name of Howard, he used to own the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins, a hockey team. And uh, he was in the film business also, made a bunch of movies, Howard Baldwin was his name. And he said, Mike, you got violated on your parole last time, I don't want that to happen again. He was a really good friend. Come on the lot with me, read some scripts, maybe we'll make a movie, I want you to stay out of trouble. So I'm on the lot, I'm reading scripts, he's paying me a little money, I'm staying out of trouble. My agent at the time, Jack Gelardi from ICM, calls me up. He say, Mike, there's some guy by the name of David Chase. He's a writer developing a show about a mob family in New Jersey, and they're developing it for Fox, and he wants you to come board as a consultant or a producer or something like that. He said, give it some thought. I said, you know this guy, David Chase? He said, I heard of him. He's a decent writer, so on and so forth. So I think about it. I'm out on parole and all this, and, and I pass, right? I said, nah, I don't want to get involved in that. That's how smart I was at the time, right? Anyway, Fox rejected it. You know, what happened is history after that. HBO picked it up, and there's The Sopranos. But getting it done was very, very difficult, and David Chase was one rough character to deal with. So I'm going to read you this article. I'm going to give you some of my uh, uh, feelings and my perspective on it. But again, for all of you that want to get a movie made, want to get a television series done, and yes, you might be proud of your material and it might be great, but that's not always the deciding factor. It's how you package it. It's what the dynamics are going uh, on at the network or the studio or the streaming platform. There's so many things involved in it, you know, to get something done. It's not easy, even for the best of them. Martin Scorsese, sometimes it took him 20 years to get projects done that he wanted to get done. So it's not an easy business, but let's talk about The Sopranos 
else. I think it's a very interesting story. In 1999, during its first season on HBO, The Sopranos was the biggest TV show in the world. And you know what? 1999, that's 24 years ago. Gosh, I'm getting old. Can you believe it's that long? 24 years ago. The biggest TV show in the world. It didn't have the largest audience. Its ratings were still dwarfed by network hits like ER and Friends, but it had cultural cachet. There's something about the mob genre, people, you can't deny it. Cultural cachet, uh, you know, a series about the mob. And people, you know, you can't deny it. You know, even people on YouTube today, everybody has an audience. People want to hear about it. You know, that's just the way it is. The dark, sometimes comic tale of a mob boss from New Jersey was omnipresent, discussed and debated everywhere, from the New York Times to The Tonight Show to every water cooler in the country. That's how popular the show was back then. It was so critical beloved that during its first year, Saturday Night Live didn't parody the show itself, but the review. The Sopranos will one day replace oxygen as the thing we breathe in order to stay alive, read a fake critical assessment. That's how popular this show was. And you know what? It was groundbreaking in many, many ways. It was the series that started all these incredible series that we have now and that came after. It all started with a mob show, The Sopranos. But the series at the full front of a golden age in television was chaos behind the scenes with a depressed, vindictive creator, that's David Chase, an alcoholic leading man with self-esteem issues, that was Gandolfini, and a struggling cable company that invested its future in a show about a star James Gandolfini once described it as a bunch of fat guys from New Jersey. So HBO wasn't what HBO is today. They were struggling at that time. Remember, network TV was big, cable wasn't. Nobody involved in The Sopranos from creator David Chase to any of the actors thought it would even survive. The success of The Sopranos really came down to one man, David Chase, the creator, who was already in his mid-50s when the series premiered. In middle age, he was determined to, quote, write a script which the material wasn't pre-chewed for viewers. He was, you know, some of these creative people, they're, they're geniuses in their own way, but some of them are dark. They, they got these, these, I don't know, these things about them. You know, I've met with many writers and many people in the industry, and in a way, some of them are just strange. I mean, I can't, you know, maybe that's, that's the sign of, of being a genius or having this creative, you know, genius about you. I don't know what it is, but some of them are just a little crazy. As Chase explained, on network, everybody says exactly what they're thinking at all the time. I want my characters to be telling lies. He also didn't want huggable moments where characters learn something before the end of each episode. He didn't tell the, you know, the cast what was happening. You know, they got the script that day. They didn't know what was happening. I remember uh, somebody telling me that. And above all, he didn't want it to resemble anything else on TV. Totally different. I wanted to make a little movie every week, he says. Chase's disdain for the mainstream TV was apparent. There are things in The Sopranos that are just FUs to network TV. He hated network TV. A native of Clifton, New Jersey, Chase grew up in an abusive household. His mother once threatened to blind him with a fork because he wanted a Hammond organ, and he struggled with depression. When asked if he ever contemplated suicide as a teen, Chase answered, well, doesn't everybody? This is the writer of one of the greatest television series of all times, if not the greatest. The guy was depressed. He was kind of a maniac in some ways. Uh, he was very, very dark and yet he was brilliant. His dark thoughts only got worse when he graduated from Stanford and moved to Hollywood in the 70s with dreams of writing feature films like his idol, Federico Fellini. Instead, he ended up in TV, a medium that he despised. David Chase hated television, hated. He was writing formulatic scripts for shows like The Rockford Files. That's how he started. You know, everybody's gotta start somewhere. For all you writers out there that are struggling, trying to get into the industry, you should talk to Jazz Palminteri, he was one of them at one time, uh, stuck to his guns and got the Bronx tail made. Amazing story behind that. But uh, don't give up. You know, you got to start somewhere. If you have that genius inside you and you have the, uh, you know, the determination to make it work, you'll get there. David Chase developed a reputation of being way too dark, according to Chase himself. Larry Connor, a Sopranos writer and a longtime friend of David Chase, says... Chase became known in the TV industry as a good writer, but what's going on in his brain, we don't want to be part of. Imagine that. Good writer, but everybody was looking at this guy like, you know, 
he might be crazy. He's very dark. He, he seemed to be depressed all the time. And look at how brilliant he was. The first season of The Sopranos had all the elements that would have gotten toned down or outright banned right from a network. You could have never made this show on network television. You couldn't curse, couldn't do a lot of things. The murders had to be caught. A lot of stuff would have never worked on network television. It's all about depression, cancer, and death. The heart of the show is the casual violence, murder, and betrayal folded into the humdrum routines of family life. And you know, that's what I love the most about The Sopranos, that the family dynamic there. You know, here's a gangster, and listen, I grew up with that, so I, I totally can relate. But you know, going through the same issues that normal people go through, maybe a little bit more intense in some ways, but in, you know, in the meantime, murder, mayhem, all this stuff was going on, but Tony and Carmela Soprano were driving their kids to school, they were going shopping, attending weddings and funerals. In other words, gangsters are us. Scarface meets Ozzie and Harriet. For those of you that are young, you don't know Ozzie and Harriet. That was about the most uh, bland television show you could ever imagine. Very popular, but it was just about a normal blue collar family. People loved it, but man, what a departure from The Sopranos. But here you had, you know, a gangster, mob boss, and his wife doing the normal stuff that all people do, driving their kids, having issues with them. You saw the series, you know. The Sopranos writer's room became like group therapy, according to one of the writers. Writers were urged to draw on their own experiences and all sorts of things would come out. Someone would say, I went out with this guy last night. Tell us, tell us, feed the machine, feed the machine. The writers would chant, pounding the table. You know, it's amazing when a group of writers got together and they're trying to get those creative juices going, they just start talking among each other and all of a sudden things come out. And I understand that. I sat with writers a couple of times and we just sat there and we talked. I would say something, all of a sudden, wow, that's incredible. And they write a scene, they write a story about it. It's amazing, the process. Chase's own life wasn't spared from being fodder for material. Tony's mother, Livia, was an almost exact clone of Chase's mother, a passive aggressive woman who wouldn't answer the telephone after dark and wouldn't drive in the rain. That was his mom. Even the mob had strong opinions about what Tony should and shouldn't do. If, listen to this. After one episode aired in which Tony is shown wearing shorts at a cookout, Gandolfini received a phone call late at night and somebody said, Adon doesn't wear shorts. A gruff, a gruff voice told him before hanging up. So the mob maybe did get involved. And maybe it was just some guy from the neighborhood who said, hey, we don't wear shorts. That's not true, by the way. My dad would wear shorts all the time. As a matter of fact, I'll never forget, I'd be playing baseball, and he'd come into the dugout with Bermuda shorts on, you know, knee-length black socks and sandals. And people would look at him like, you know, is that the style? But he didn't care. My dad, you know, dressed the way he wanted to dress. And he would sit in the dugout like that and chat with all of us, you know. He was cool in that way, but he didn't look too cool. The more popular the series got, winning Emmys and Golden Globes and becoming the first event TV show not aired by a network, the angrier Chase became. The more success he had with the show, the angrier he became. This was really a dark guy. What was driving the show and driving David is that he doesn't like the world as he finds it, and he certainly doesn't like the world of television, said one of his close friends. Imagine that. So the more success he had, the angrier he got, the more depressed he got, the more mean that he got. You know, I'm telling you, people, Hollywood, it, it isn't all about money in life, you know? How many people had so much money, had people adoring them, and they were the most miserable people? Some of them, you know, I always think of Robin Williams and some of these people that you thought had it all and there they are suicidal depressed not happy with where they are in life it's a strange dynamic with the pressure higher than ever to top himself he always wanted to be better than the last episode chase started to torment his crew and his writing staff he demonized people the objects of his hatred would change the wardrobe person the casting director his secretary and then he would go back on prozac Wow, he was on Prozac. So the, the more popular the show became, the wealthier he became, the worse he got. How do you figure that out? I have a hard time processing that. I don't know, maybe I'm a different kind of person. Maybe I'm normal, you know, I don't know. Maybe hopefully everybody will agree with me that when you're starting to do better in life, your spirits elevate. You don't get more depressed. You don't get angrier. Some people do get meaner because they think, hey, you know, they're narcissistic now and they're, you know, better than everybody else. It's not a good way to be. 
Chase wasn't the only one who seemed to grow more miserable with each new accolade. Gandolfini had alcohol and drug problems. He often disappeared for a few days at a time, holding up production. I had heard this. The more he was celebrated and awarded for his work on the show, the deeper in despair he sank. Again, it's very, very hard to understand that you know, dynamic in people. The more popular you get, the more people love you, the more success you have, the deeper in despair that you grow. But yet we know it happens. Again, bring up Robin Williams, you know, and now Gandolfini. We're finding this out. I don't understand that. I really don't. It's hard for me to relate to that. After negotiating for a huge salary hike towards the end of season four, he sank even deeper into melancholy. Getting more money, getting more popular, and yet he's getting more miserable. Wow. The show was more than just a wildly popular series that made millions for everyone involved. It changed the entire landscape of TV as we know it, moving the goalposts of what was possible on the small screen. Make no mistake, The Sopranos made HBO, built that network, without a doubt. It actually built cable. Cable wasn't that popular back then in 99. The Sopranos made it happen. You know, you could say what you want about the mob life, and I'll agree with you. I'm not glorifying the life. But there is a hunger and a thirst and an appetite for things related to the mob genre. I mean, come on. I wouldn't be on YouTube speaking to you if people weren't interested in that genre. And some of the other guys, the same thing. You know, I don't know what it is. Again, it's the media. It's Hollywood. It shows like this. It's, uh, you know, Scarface. It's The Godfather 1 and 2. It's, it's Goodfellas. It's all of these shows that people just have an appetite for. You gotta admit it. For HBO, The Sopranos had become what Pulp Fiction had been for Miramax, a magnet for talent. Writers, directors, and actors who once insisted they would only work in feature films flocked to HBO. Look what that show did. People that wouldn't go near HBO was like a failure network. It's like it was an embarrassment to be there. And that's how David Chase first viewed it. Now, because of the success of Sopranos, Everybody's flocking to HBO. Writers, directors, producers, actors, they all wanted to be part of HBO, all because of The Sopranos. The Sopranos was the hammer that broke the glass ceiling for us, says the network's former CEO, often cited as the architect of HBO's golden age. Sopranos were the architect of HBO's golden age. Approximately 18 million of HBO's 29 million subscribers watched the final episode of The Sopranos during the summer of 2007, which was, at the time, an unprecedented audience for cable. Amazing. Chase was apparently shot, listen to this, because everybody had something to say about the last episode of The Sopranos. I was disappointed. I kind of like things wrapped up, you know, okay, it's over, you know, done with, move on. Uh, some people don't like that. Some people, hey, you know, it was okay. I like to, you know, wondering what's going on after that. We're all wondering if maybe The Sopranos would happen again. Maybe that's why we didn't really know how it ended with Tony. But David Chase was very upset about that. He said he was apparently shocked that the audiences wanted Tony to end the series by getting whacked or at least punished in some way. And this was a quote. They wanted to see him go face down in, in Linguini, he said. And I just thought, God, you watched this guy for seven years. I know he's a criminal, but don't tell me you don't love him in some way. Don't tell me you're not on his side in some way. And now you want to see him killed? David had a problem with that. He said, man, you know, this is your main character. You fell in love with him. He was a family guy. You watched him for seven years. He was so popular, everything else. But now you want to see him die. You want to see him face down in a bowl of pasta, you know, and that really bothered this guy. And it's amazing how, you know, how involved he got with his characters that that would bother him so much. He said he was shocked. Chase in recent years has said that the cut to black meant that Tony was killed, but he was annoyed by their bloodlust just as he was annoyed by their adoration. This guy, uh, I'm telling you, he was annoyed by the fact that they wanted him killed. He was also annoyed that they adored Tony. So you can't have it both ways, but apparently he did. And uh, ultimately, The Sopranos ended much like it began by defying everything we'd come to expect from a television show. And that's when, you know, the uh, ending was left kind of up in the air. Was he dead? Is he 
going to return? What really happened? Nobody knew. But, you know, according to Chase, it meant he was dead, you know, that he got killed. Tremendous series. You know, I, look, we've done some episodes here. I think just about everybody watching has seen most of The Sopranos. But understand, that was the groundbreaking series that really set the tone for cable TV and set the tone for all the brilliant series that followed. And there have been many. And I got to tell you, you know, it all starts with a great script, people. All you writers out there, write a tremendous script. Write a great script and then do whatever you have to do. Be diligent in getting it into the hands of the right people. It's a process. It's grueling. It's tough. This is a tough business, you know, but you got to stick with it. And if you're a brilliant writer, that's where it all begins. It all starts with the script. Don't let anybody tell you any differently. It all starts with the script. So all you writers out there, all you producers, you know, that are starting up, starts with the script. Make it beautiful. Make it great. People will change it here and there, but they can recognize a great script. So that's the story with The Sopranos. You know, this, this is never going to die. It really isn't. It'll never die. There'll never be another Sopranos. There's been other great series, Boardwalk Empire and, and uh, you know, Godfather of Harlem and other ones, but only one soprano. So that's it for today, my friends. How do I always leave you? Same way, it's not going to change. Be safe. You know the deal. You know the deal, women. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless each and every one of you through this holiday season. And yes, I'll see you next time.